the order for evening prayer daily throughout the year. I'll try you and God, correct and teach me, but with judgment and mercy, not in anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Dearly beloved, let us confess our sins to Almighty God, mighty and everlasting God. We have and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have not taken your name and time attributes with the depth seriousness as we should have, nor your word or other works in thought, meditation, by profession, everything to your glory. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults, restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus so. Amen. The Almighty and everlasting God gives us assurance in his word that he pardons and accepts us as righteous in Jesus by confidential faith, fiduciary faith in his merits put to our account. And that it he evermore pardons and blesses us in the way, giving us his gifts of grace. Wherefore, let us ever beseech him that we may walk humbly and believingly until at length he calls us to our eternal home through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord, the Lord's name be praised. Now we pick up with Psalm 18, verse 12. At the brightness which was before his clouds passed away, there was a hailstorm and coals of fire. The psalmist again returns to the lightnings which by dividing and cleaving of the clouds lay open the heaven, and therefore he says that the which he had set before him in token of his anger, with the depriving of men of their enjoyment of the light of his countenance, passed away at the brightness before him. These sudden changes affect us much more lively sense of the power, and the agency of God than natural phenomena which move on in uniform course. He adds that there followed a hailstorm and coals of fire, which for when thunder separates, thunders asunder the clouds, and either breaks out in lightnings, or the clouds resolve themselves into hail. So Calvin continues to use the metaphors for the coming and going of God's blessing. And now for Prof. Kyle, he's discussing Exodus in connection with other Pentateuchal books. Exodus 1, 1 to 7 connects the history of the people of God as found in Exodus with the history of Genesis by narrating how the 70 descendants of Jacob who had migrated to Egypt had come to be the people of Israel and that God who offers himself as liberator to Moses and the people is also the God of those fathers of whom Genesis spake. His covenant with the patriarchs and his promises to them are the reasons why he cares at all for Israel. And when Moses intercedes for the sinful people, 
the most effective motive found in God's promises are those promises made to the patriarchs. We have come to really trust Prof. Harrison and Prof. Kyle now in this, on the third day of the dry, which God called earth, and the gathering of the waters, the place into which the waters were collected, he called sea. Yamim, an intensive rather than a numerical plural, is the great ocean, which surrounds the mainland on all sides, so that the earth appears to be founded upon seas, 94 verse 2. Earth and sea are two constituents of the globe, by the separation of which its formation was completed. The seas include the rivers which flow into the ocean and the lakes which are detached fragments of the ocean, though they are not specifically mentioned here. By the divine act of naming the two constituents of the globe, the divine approval which follows, the work is stamped with permanency. In the second act of the third day, the clothing of the earth with vegetation is immediately connected. At the command of God, the earth brought forth green, dasheta, seed yielding fruit herb, ashet, and fruit bearing fruit trees, base pari. These three classes embrace all the productions of the veg. Dasha, the young tender green which shoots up after rain and covers the meadows and the downs, is a generic name for all grasses and cryptogamous plants. Eved with the epithet mazare, zare, yielding or forming seed is used as a generic term for plants, corn, vegetables, and other plants by which seed pods are formed. Ace pari, not only fruit trees, but all trees and shrubs bearing fruit in which there is a seed according to its kind, fruit with kernels, all ares upon the earth, is not to be joined to fruit tree as though indicating the superior size of the trees which bear seed upon the earth, in distinction from vegetables which propagate their species upon or in the ground, or even the latter bear their seed above the earth, it is appended to ha dashe, a more minute explanation. The earth is to bring forth grass, herb, and trees upon or above the ground as an ornament or for covering it. La mini, after its kind from mean species, which is not only repeated in verse 12 in the old form, la minehu, in case of fruit trees, but is also appended to the herb. It indicates that herbs and trees sparing out of the earth according to their kinds and receive together with power to bear fruit and seed the capacity to propagate and multiply their own kind. And now for our geography lesson, finishing, I believe, Naftal, I'm going on to the tribe of Dan. But also small resemblance between Coram and Karam, not to mention the fact that the accents separate Coram from Migdal El, <coughs> whilst the omission of a copula before Coram cannot have any weight, as the copula is also wanting before Zur and Rakat. Coram and Beit Anat have not yet been discovered. From the latter place, Naphtali was unable to expel the Canaanites. Beit Shemesh, a different place from the town of the same name in, in Issachar, is still unknown. The total number of towns is given as 19, whereas only 16. It is hardly correct to seek for the missing places among the border towns mentioned in verses 33 34. 
as the enumeration of the towns themselves is introduced by Va'er Meeps, the Tsar, verse 35. And in this way, the list of towns is separated from the description of the boundaries. To this we may add that the town of Carthen or Kirkjot, Kirkjot, which Naphtali gave up to the Levites, does not occur among the towns in the list of towns, from which we may see the list of towns is an imperfect one. Verse 40 to 48, the inheritance of the tribe of Dan. This fell to the west of Benjamin between Judah and Ephraim and was formed by Judah, giving up some northern towns in Ephraim, some of its towns to the Danites, so as to furnish them with a territory proportionate to their number, situated for the most part in the lowland Shephelah, including, however, the hill country and the mountains extended over uh, the plain of Sharon so that it belonged to one of the most fruitful portions of Palestine. The boundaries are not given because they could be traced from those in adjoining territories. Verse 41, from Judah, the families of Dan received Zoria and Eshel <coughs> on the border of Judah. <coughs> but of these, the Danites did not take possession as they were given up by Judah to the Levites. Salabin and Salbim, which remained in the hands of the Canaanites, is frequently mentioned in the history of David and Solomon. It may possibly be the present Salabit, some distance to the north of these three places of join. And we turn now to Isaiah, and we finish. Are we going to finish it? No, not quite talking about the denunciations of sin and God calling the armies of sinners to punish other sinners. The soldiers shall be bold and daring, roaring and shouting before a battle, all which brings terrors all about him. The voice of their enemies roaring against them, and they shall not be able to report, turn a deaf ear, to it. The enemy shall come in the flood, and there shall be none to lift him up. He shall siege the prey, and none shall deliver him. None shall be able to deliver it, none so much as dare to attempt the deliverance of it, but shall give it up for lost. Let the distressed look where they will. Everything appears dismal. For if God frown upon it, how can any creature smile? First look round to the earth, to the land, to that land that used to be a land of light and joy of the whole earth. And behold darkness and sorrow, frightful, mournful, nothing hopeful. Secondly, look to heaven, and there light is darkened, where one would expect to have found it. If the light is darkened in the heavens, how great is that darkness? If God hide his face, no marvel, the heavens hides theirs and appear gloomy. It is our wisdom by keeping a good conscience to keep the line clear between us and heaven, that we may have light from above even when clouds and darkness are around us. We'll move on to Isaiah 6 tomorrow. Now for a few tidbits from Dr. Martin on the Gospel of Mark. Thus the facts of the early dissemination and recognition point to two conclusions. First, it was immediately received on its publication as a fundamental witness to the life of Christ, and its prestige in this church was greatest just after it was written. These features led Rawlinson to believe that the gospel was circulated with the backing of some important church. He found the double tradition that this church was one at Rome 
and that Peter's authority assured to the gospel a ready reception of churches throughout the Christian world most adequately explained its initial acceptance. Second, after Mark was incorporated in the later evangelical records, his popularity waned and was seldom quoted in the following centuries. As a consequence of the modern assessment of Mark as the earliest gospel to be written, and the claim that, that it objectively records Jesus' historical life, Two suppositions deriving from H. J. Holzman's Die Synoptischen Evangeline. The Gospel of Mark has come into its own again. The last century, a biblical scholar has witnessed a resurgence of interest in this Gospel and writer. The saint who had first found grace to pen the life which was the life of man, El Husman. Overrated, overstated, we believe. And now for Sean Jameson and his comments on 23 to 25 to talk about demonology. Some notable features in this general possible policy are undoubtedly intended by the marked distinctions of terms in the Old Testament. One thing comes out clearly enough that these demon possessions were totally different from the ordinary operations of the devil and the souls of men. Otherwise, the distinction would be unintelligible, and they were not to be confounded with any other bodily disease as lunacy or epilepsy is evident both from their being expressly distinguished from all such in this very passage and from the personal intelligence, tensions, and actions ascribed to him in the New Testament. Deeply mysterious is such agency, and one cannot but inquire what may have been the reason why such amazing activity and virulence were allowed during our Lord's sojourn upon earth. The answer to this, at least, is not difficult. For if all the miracles were designed to illustrate the character of Jesus' mission, and if for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 38, there can be no doubt that it was to make this destruction all the more manifest and illustrious that the enemy was allowed such terrifying awe in at this period. Thus we might imagine it said that the great enemy from above, with respect to the mighty power allowed him at this time, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared to all the earth. Romans 9, 17. Demonology in the New Testament. And we go on to the Prof. Hodge on Romans 2, verse 3. But thinkest this, O man, O man, the truth is that God's judgment is just and will fall on those themselves that commit the sins which they condemn in others. It is so plain that the apostle exclaims at the folly of those who seem to deny their sin. The emphasis lies on the word thou in the middle of the verse. Dost thou think that thou, a Jew, and because a Jew, shall escape the righteous judgment of God, shall escape ec fuxe. Everyone says the commentator Bengal, who is arraigned fugue, tries to escape. He who is acquitted escapes. In verse 1, the apostle has shown that the man who did what he condemned in others, condemned himself. If then, as the ancient Theophilact says, 
He cannot escape his own judgment, or will he escape the judgment of God? If forced to condemn ourselves, how much more will the infinitely holy God condemn us? Closed quote. The ground on which this false and absurd expectation rested is mentioned in the following verses. Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and longsuffering? That is, admitting the general principle that those who do what they condemn in others are themselves exposed to condemnation. Do you expect exemption on the ground of the peculiar goodness of God? That this was the expectation of the Jews is plain from the Apostles' argument here and in the following chapter, and from chapter 9 through 11. Compare also Matthew 3, 9. Think not to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, and John 8, 33. To despisest, despise the riches of God. To say despise katafranein is to form a low estimate of. To despise the goodness of God when they form such a wrong estimate as to suppose that he gives them a license to sin. To imagine that he will not punish either because he's patient or because he's good toward us, us so that we shall escape though others are perishing. The words Christos on okay and Makrothenia express the divine goodness under different angles. The first means is expressed in giving favors. The second means patience. The third, forbearance, slowness in the infliction of punishment. The reason why the Jews, as referred to by the apostle and men in general, thus abuse the goodness of God is expressed by the clause not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance. Agnaon means not knowing, not understanding, not comprehending, the true nature and design. Men abuse the goodness of God because they do not rightly apprehend that instead of indicating the purpose not to punish, rather, God's goodness is designed to lead them to forsake their sins. The goodness of God leads us to repentance because it shows us our duty to a being who is so kind because it gives us ground to hope for acceptance. The word age, which means lead, says Dr. Wordsworth, canon of Westminster Assembly, uh, Westminster Abbey, in his elegant and scholarly work on the Greek Testament, intimates, quote, not only the will of God, but the will of man. God leads man may refuse to be led. Deus ducat volentem duci, as Bengal says, ducat suavitor non cogit. Very true. But who gives the will to be led? Is there not some preceding grace? Does not God work in us to will as well as to do? Surely there is such a thing as being made willing without being forced. There is a middle ground between moral suasion and coercion. God supersedes the necessity of forcing by making us willing in the day of his power. The apostle, however, is not here speaking of gracious influence, but of the moral tendencies of providential dispensations. We'll take up 2-5 tomorrow. As we zero in on Revelation 14, 1 through 5, a change in the scenery from chapter 12 and 13. Here we have one of the most pleasing sights 
that can be viewed in this world. The Lord Jesus Christ at the head of his faithful adherents. How Christ appears as the Lamb standing upon Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the gospel church. Christ is with this church in the midst of all her troubles. He stands there. And therefore, the church is not consumed. It is his presence that secures her perseverance. The appearance as a lamb, a true lamb, the lamb of God. Perfect lamb is mentioned as rising out of the earth in the last chapter, which was really a dragon. Here Christ appears as the true Pashko lamb to show that his mediatorial Government is the fruit of his sufferings and the cause of his people's safety and their fidelity. Now we turn to Pentecostalism in Latin America. The spirit and text of the scripture. A characteristic of Pentecostal hermeneutics is the importance placed on the text of Scripture. We disagree here. According to Irvin, a new epistemology will lead to a deepening respect for the witness to the Scriptures to themselves. An experience of the spirit of the Scriptures directs attention to the presence of the Spirit in scriptures. Whether it is a fundamentalist reading of the Bible under the influence of Protestant missionaries, or the magical properties into the text by popular religion, an encounter with the Bible is thought to offer an encounter with the Spirit of God. Archer argues that early Pentecostalism adopted the pre-critical approach to scripture <clears throat> that was developed amongst Wesleyan and Keswickian holy, holiness folks. This gives rise to reading of the scripture that may be associated with the concept of biblical realism that is developed by accolades. With this approach, the language of scripture conveys an encounter with the real. As the Bible describes the presence of God in the world, the experience of this presence amidst a conflict with evil, evil, it is read realistically rather than simply symbolically. The miraculous intervention of God and the demonic opposition worked by the devil are not images for social and psychological dynamics. They are rather to be read as the disclosure of reality in which the reader lives. 3.2, the spirit and context of scripture in community. The spirit who is encountered in the text forges a community with the text and its meaning is to be received. The hermeneutic outlined by Archer involves the triadic negotiation for meaning between the biblical text, Pentecostal community, and the Holy Spirit. Pentecostal theologians draw attention to the Council of Jerusalem and Acts 15 as an example of this dynamic. First, the church considers the work of spirit among the Gentiles and that led by the Spirit to the reading of Scripture, by the illuminations of the Holy Spirit, leads to a new understanding of the work of God in the world. In this way, the Holy Spirit is seen as acting through the text of, of Scripture, experiences such as sign and wonders and testimonies in the group. Not terribly enlightening, really, that volume, that article. We come back to Prof. Hodge on his testimony of the scriptures against the dogmatic rationalists. 
They taught that the gospel was not a system of truth derived from reason or sustained by its authority, but the testimony of God. They expressly assert as the New Testament writers were matters of revelation to be received on divine testimony. Quote, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man in him? Such being the nature of the gospel, if received at all, it must be received on the authority of God. It was to be believed and taken on trust, not demonstrated as a philosophical system. Nay, the Bible goes still further. It teaches that a man must become a fool in order to be wise. He must renounce dependence upon his own wisdom or reason in order to see God's wisdom. Our Lord told his disciples that unless they were converted and became as little children, they couldn't enter the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul in the Epistle to the Romans and in those addressed to the Ephesians and Colossians, that is, when writing to those imbued with the Greek and with the Oriental philosophy, made it the indispensable condition of their becoming Christians, they were told that they should renounce philosophy as a guide in matters to religion and to receive the gospel upon the testimony of God. Nothing, therefore, can be more opposed to the whole teaching and spirit of the Bible position to insist on philosophic proof of the articles of our faith. Our duty, privilege, and security are in believing, not in knowing, in trusting God and not our own understanding. They are to be pitied who have no more trustworthy teacher than themselves. The sixth argument, the instructions of the Bible on this subject, dogmatic rationalism, are abundantly confirmed by the lessons of experience. From the time of the second century Gnostics and the Platonizing Fathers of Alexandria, Egypt, the attempt has been made in every age including Thomas Aquinas, to exalt faith into knowledge, to transmute and transform Christianity into philosophy by demonstrating the doctrines on the principles of reason. These attempts have always failed. They have all proved ephemeral and worthless. Each successive theorizer viewing with more or less contempt the speculations of his predecessors, yet imagining that he has the gifts for comprehending the Almighty. We'll see that again later in process theology. These attempts are not only abortive, they are always evil in their effects upon the authors and those who study with them and ultimately on the churches and those who are influenced by them. Go by the Bible, not philosophy. Now we turn to Prof. Raymond, and we're talking about the infinite holiness of the majestic God. Gerhard S. Voss concludes in regard to transcendent and majestic holiness. Thank God for Jesus and his righteous merits. Dr. Voss of Princeton writes, the old Princeton, taking divine holiness in this form, we can easily perceive that it is not really an attribute to be coordinated with the other attributes distinguished in the divine nature. Rather, it is co-extensive with and applicable 
to everything that can be said about God. He is holy in everything that characterizes him and reveals him holy in his goodness and grace, holy in his righteousness and wrath. God is also ethically distinct from sinful men. As we've already noted, the scriptures employ the same word groups <coughs> that it uses <coughs> to describe God's majestic holiness, attesting to his ethical holiness. Just as the creator is transcendentally separate from men as creatures, so is he ethically separate separate from sinners morally pure infinite eternally and unchangeably so concerning his character his thoughts his actions there is not the slightest taint of evil desire impure motive or unholy inclination about him the scriptures show this over and over a few verses, Psalm 5, verses 4 and 6, 4 to 6. You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you, the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men, the Lord of whores. Psalm 11, verses 5 through 7. The Lord examines the righteous man and acquits them, but the wicked and those who love violence his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. A bright man will see his face. Habakkuk 1.13, your eyes are too pure to behold evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. 1 John 1.5, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Because God is majestically transcendent and ethically pure, it becomes important to draw a circle of holiness around him which shall bar, bar out the profane, says Gerhardus Voss. Accordingly, heaven is called holy, which is holy. His temples are holy. His commandments are called holy. The Sabbath day is called holy. If men are to live in God's presence at all, they must not wantonly stray across the holy barrier between them and him, or transgress his holy laws that outline this barrier. Specifically, if men are to live in his presence, they must obey the laws he regards as essential to the protection of his majestic and ethical holiness from all profanation which God, as their creator, has written on their hearts and revealed at the Mount of Sinai. Those who obey his laws he judges to be holy, but those who transgress his holy laws he regards <clears throat> as mounting an assault upon the glory of his own divine transcendence and moral purity. And he treats them accordingly as transgressors and sinners. And now we turn to the church. The doctrine of the church and the use of the words in the Old and New Testaments for the church. We're in the sixth of seven loci of theology. Noticing that the Roman Catholic Church puts the doctrine of the church right up front. Here, we put it after the doctrine of salvation. The church consists of the saved, justified, adopted, sanctified, and are being saved, and given joy, peace of conscience, and other benefits that do flow from or accompany 
those saving benefits. The preposition in the word ecclesia is often interpreted to mean called out from among the common mass of people to indicate in connection with the scriptural use of ecclesia that the church consists of the elect called out of the world of humanity. The interpretation is rather doubtful, however, for the preposition originally simply denoted Greek citizens who were called out of their homes to an assembly. Now, it would not have been unnatural if that entirely scriptural idea had been put into the word of God's revelation. But as a matter of fact, we have no proof that this was actually done. The compound verb ek Kaleo is never so used, and the word ecclesia, or church, never occurs in a context which suggests the presence of that particular thought in the mind of the writer. Adolf Deisman would simply write ecclesia as the convened assembly, regarding God as the convener. Because the idea of the church is a many-sided concept, it's quite natural that the word ecclesia is applied to it, but does not always have exactly the same connotation. Jesus was the first one to use the word in the New Testament, and he applied it to the company around him in Matthew 16:18 that recognized him publicly as their Lord and accepted the principles of the kingdom of God. It was the ecclesia of the Messiah, the true Israel. Later on, as a result of the extension of the church, the, require, the word required additional significations. Local churches were established everywhere. They were called the ecclesiae in the plural since they were manifestations of the one universal Church of Christ. The following are the most important uses of the word. Most frequently, the word ecclesia designates a certain circle of believers in some definite locality, a local church, irrespective of the question whether the believers are or are not assembled for worship. Some passages contain the idea that they are assembled, while other passages do not, such as Ephesus, Colossae, the church at Philippi, church at Corinth, the church at Rome. God's working everywhere to call his elect. In some cases, the word denotes what may be called a domestic ecclesia, the church in a house of some individual. It seems that in apostolic times, wealthy or other important persons set aside a large room in their home for divine worship. Instances of the use of this word are found in Romans, 1 Corinthians, Colossians, and Philemon. If the reading of Count Tischendorf is correct, as is now taken for granted, the word is found at least once in the singular to denote a group of churches, namely the churches of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. The passage in which it is so used is Acts 9.1. Naturally, this does not yet mean that they together constituted an organization such as we now call a denomination. It is not impossible that the Church of Jerusalem and the Church of Antioch in Syria also comprised several groups that were accustomed to meet in several places. Well, some elucidations there as we turn to church history. The first period of church history, 1 to 100, and we are dealing with the date of Christ's death. It seems strange indeed that Jewish priests should have matured their bloody counsel on the solemn night of the Passover and urged a crucifixion on the great festival 
but it agrees with the depths of satanic wickedness in their mind. Moreover, it is on the other hand equally difficult to explain that they, together with the people, should have remained about the cross till late in the afternoon of the 14th, when according to law they were to kill the Paschal lamb and prepare for the feast. And that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea with the pious women should have buried the body of Jesus and so incurred defilement at that solemn hour. The view here advocated is strengthened by astronomical calculation, which shows that it was probably the year A.D. 30, the probable year of the crucifixion. The 15th of Nisan actually fell on a Friday, April 7. This was the case only once more between the years A.D. 28 and 36, except perhaps 33. Consequently, Christ must have been crucified, A.D. 30. To sum up the results, the following appear to us the most probable dates for the life of Christ. Birth, 4 to 5 B.C. Baptism, A.D. 27. Length of public ministry, 3 or 4 years, 27 to 30 A.D. Crucifixion. April 7, A.D. 30. Tomorrow we'll take up the land and the people during Jesus' time and the apostles. The fourth period of church history, 590 to 1049, and with a discussion of Mohammedanism, he has told us earlier that it was the scourge and judgment of God against the Middle Eastern and Eastern churches for their idolatries and contentions and fights. There was a lot of it in the East. It should be mentioned, however, that according to the testimony of missionaries and African travelers, Mohammedism has inflamed the simple-minded African tribes with the impure fire of fanaticism, giving them greater power of resistance to Christianity. Sir William Moore, a very competent judge, thinks that Mohammedism, by poisoning influence of polygamy and slavery, and by crushing all freedom of judgment and religion, has interposed the most effective barrier against the reception of Christianity. No system, the judge says, could have been devised with more consummate skill for shutting out the nations over which it has sway for the light of truth. Idolatrous Arabs might have been aroused to spiritual life and the adoption of the faith of Jesus, but Mohammedan Arabia is to the human eye, eye sealed against the benign influences of the gospel. The sword of Muhammad and the Quran are the most fatal enemies of civilization, liberty, freedom, and the gospel. This is no doubt true of the past, but we have not yet seen the end of history. It is not impossible that Islam may yet prove to be a necessary condition for the revival of pure scriptural religion in the East. Protestant missionaries from England and America enjoy greater liberty under the Mohammedan rule than they would have under a Greek or Russian government. That was written late in the 19th century and we've seen no change in the and elsewhere. We continue our work on the Swiss Reformation, 1519 to 1605, on this man, William Farrell. William Farrell, 1485 to 1565. To 15, 1565. Farrell spent a year in Strasbourg with Busser and Capito. Those were two other Swiss, uh, Swiss reformers. 
Before he went there, he made a brief visit to Zurich, Schaffhausen, and Constance. He became acquainted with Zwingli, Myconius, and Grable. He had a letter to Luther from Oikolampadius, but it is not likely that he went to Wittenberg since there's no allusion to it in his or Luther's letters. At the request of Ulrich, Duke of Württemberg, he preached in Mompelkard and roused a fierce opposition, which forced him soon to return to Strasbourg. Here he found Faber and other friends of Mew, whom the persecution had forced to flee. In 1526, Farrell was again in Switzerland and settled for a while at the advice of Haller, a school teacher under the name of Ursinus, with reference to Bern, at Agel, in the Pays de Vaud on the borders of the Valais, subject to Bern. We'll take that up tomorrow. And we return to the baffle gabbing and the philosophy of process theology that has been so damaging to people who prefer reason to the simple statements of the Bible. And yet we have to examine them as forensic theologians. With this pan-entheistic view of God, God is always changing. It's completely against the Bible. Hartshorn has become one of the chief protagonists in the 20th century reassertion of the ontological argument. He says that the medieval Anselm really discovered something which was fundamental to his theistic proofs, namely the idea of perfection and its uniqueness. But Anselm's argument lacked cogency because it depended on a classical theistic view. This neoclassical view of perfection, Hartshorn contended, overcomes the objection of modern philosophy first that perfection cannot be consistently defined. We go by the Bible, follow Prof. Hodge on the confidence with confidence in the testimony of the eternal God, not Hartshorn up at Harvard. The thrust of Hartshorn's argument then is that perfection of the most perfect being God's changing all time. By definition, either exists necessarily, and since only the con self-contradictory is necessarily non-existent, the perfect being, if it is a self-consistent, so to speak, is in reality necess necessarily existent. Gobdelegook, <clears throat> philosophic gobdelegook, and baffle gabbing with a razzle dazzle big words. Nonsense. Lord, let us now that thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which you have prepared before the nations in the face of the world, to be a light to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Westminster Larger Catechism 112. What's required in the third of the Ten Commandments? The third commandment requires that the name of God, his titles, his attributes, his ordinances, his word, the two sacraments, prayers, God's works, 
and whatever else is there whereby God makes himself to be known is to be used by us in a holy and reverent way in our thinking, our meditations, our speech, in our writings with a holy profession and conscionable conversation done to the glory of God and to the good of ourselves and also to the good of others. While we talk about creeds, we're talking about the Roman creed. We're not Romanists, but we evaluate as forensic theologians. Bible. Now we're talking about the Vatican decrees, the Constitution with Catholic faith. Three schemes on matters of faith were prepared for the Vatican Council. One against rationalism, one on the Church of Christ, and one on Christian matrimony. The first two were revised and adopted, and the third was indefinitely postponed. There was also much discussion on the preparation of a small popular catechism adapted to the present doctrinal status of the Roman Church and intended to supersede the numerous popular catechisms in use. But the draft, which was assigned to the whole teaching power of the Church to the Pope, to the exclusion of the Episcopate in Vatican I, such opposition, 57 non-plucket, 24 conditional plucket, in the provisional vote on May 4, that was laid on the table and never taken up again. The dogmatic constitution on the Catholic faith, Constitutio Dogmatica de Fide Catholica, it was unanimously adopted in the third public session, April 24. 1870. The original draft before the council embraced 18 chapters. Pantheism, which we talked about in the Hartshorn process theology. Rationalism, which we talked about with Hodge. Scripture and tradition, which for Romanists are co-equal. Revelation, faith and reason. The Trinity, two natures of Christ. The primitive state original sin, this should be found, Christian redemption, the supernatural order of grace, but was laid aside. Archbishop Connolly of Halifax, Canada, recommended that it should be decently buried. The supernatural order of grace, what are they laying aside here? The original draft? Uh, we'll follow up on that tomorrow. We take up in brief the profession of in brief article 2 96 what Christ entrusted to the apostles they in turn handed on by their preaching and writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to all generations until Christ returns in glory. And do not forget that it's only recently that Roman Catholics have been allowed to read their Bibles. That is a recent development in the last 50 years of their history. So we've had to kind of do that in light of modern convention of printing and TV and the like. Sacred tradition is what Papa says and sacred scriptures make up a sacred deposit of the word of God. So the popes and the councils have new revelation, even though earlier they said there is no new revelation, so they contradict themselves. Which in the same time as a mirror, the pilgrim church contemplate God. Summary number two, the church in her doctrine, life and worship perpetuates and transmits to every generation all that she is herself and all that she believes, except that she keeps adding things, like the Immaculate Conception of 1850. It came out of, of the 13th, 14th century. Nobody, there was debates, fights, 
amongst the Romanists themselves, and nobody, even the Council of Trent, uh, kicked the can down the road. Now, all of a sudden, 1854, magic appears. So they create things. And then we could talk about all kinds of Romish inventions that they attach and say this is the word of God. We stick to what the fathers of the first six centuries proclaim, the sola scriptura, the sovereign role of the Bible. And it's very serious. It's a power above all popes, all churches. Thanks to the supernatural sense of faith, which they don't talk about as God's gift. The people of God as a whole never cease to welcome or penetrate more deeply and with more fully from the gift of divine revelation in the Bible and in the Popal Papers. The task of interpreting the Word of God authentically has been entrusted exclusively to the magisterium of the Church and to the Pope and the bishops in communion with him. Article 3 is now opened up on sacred scripture. And they're better than mainline liberals, I'll tell you that. Although, they're better here on paper than they are really because they've got divisions among themselves on scripture. The unique word of sacred scripture. 101. In order to reveal himself to men in condescension of his goodness, God speaks to them in holy words. Indeed, the words of God expressed in the words of men <clears throat> in human language, just as the word of the Eternal Father, when he took on himself the weak uh, the human weakness, became like men. Through all the words of sacred scripture, God speaks only one word, his utterance in whom he expresses himself completely. A quote here from Augustine on Psalm. Yet recall that one and same word of God extends throughout all scripture. That is the one and same utterance that resounds in the mouths of the sacred writers. Since he who is in the beginning with God has no need of separate syllables, for he is not subject to time. And we will take that up tomorrow. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. Save them that rule in the church and in our nation and parents in their homes. Mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Do thy ministers with Bible doctrine and righteousness of life. Make thy chosen people joyful. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none that fight for us but thou and thou alone. O God, may clean our hearts within us and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and the dangers and necessities and stretch forth thy right hand to help and ever defend us. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in quietness and rest. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lighten our darkness, O Lord, we beseech thee, and by thy omnipotent mercy. Through the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, in the time of difficulties and tribulation, bodily illnesses, temptations, hardships, challenges, conflict, Good Lord, deliver us. Lord, in the time of our wealth and prosperity, peace, joy, good Lord, deliver us also. Lord, in the final days and hours of our lives and in the hour of death, good Lord, deliver us. 
O Lord, in that hour, bring us to the heavenly Jerusalem above with the saints, apostles, martyrs, and believers gathered around that glassy crystal sea where you are exalted in refulgent glory. Good Lord, deliver us. Mighty and everlasting God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications and prayers to thee. And you've promised that where two or three are gathered together in thy name, that you're in our midst, hearing our prayers and granting those things. Fulfill now, Lord, the lawful desires and petitions of thy servants as is best suited for them and most expedient for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth as humble believers, but also forensic theologians, and grant to us life eternal through the omnipotent majesty and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Here ends the order for evening prayer daily throughout the year. Godspeed.